Mass spectroscopy. We're going to talk about mass spectroscopy. But first, a review. And a dance party. That would be my daughter, Samantha. And she doesn't think I'll leave that in, but I will. So let's talk about subatomic particles, the ones that you definitely should know. Protons and electrons are the only particles that have a charge. Protons, of, co of course, are positive. Electrons are negative. Protons and neutrons have essentially the same mass. The mass of an electron is so small that we ignore it. Okay, and you can see from this chart that the mass of an electron in atomic mass units is much, much smaller, about one two thousandths of the proton and the neutron. Quick reminder of a symbol that you may see for an element. Of course, you have the actual symbol of the element. Then you have this number is the atomic number. That is the whole number on the periodic table. It is equal to the number of protons or the electrons if the atom is neutral. This number up top is the mass number, which is the number of protons plus neutrons. This must, must be given for a particular isotope. A particular isotope. Okay, we answered this question. What about the mass of an electron? It is very small and ignored. Okay, this actually refers to this comment here, where the mass of an atom in atomic mass units is the total number of protons and neutrons in the atom. This atomic mass unit has as a reference the carbon-12 isotope, which has a atomic mass of 12 AMU, exactly. Okay, and all of the other um, masses of elements are based on this as the reference point. They use this because it's easy to store and it's easy to transport. Okay, so beginning our, continuing our review isotopes. You should remember, or hopefully know it now, isotopes are the atoms of the same element with different masses due to the different number of neutrons. It is important to note that they are chemically the same, but they do differ in physical properties. Such as the density, uh, the speed at a given temperature, average speed at a given temperature, um, diffusion rates. For example, they have a different number of neutrons. All right, so you should remember this chart. If not, let's take a look at it. Oxygen 16. There are electrons, protons, neutrons, and mass number. We can find all of these by given a particular isotope and also looking on the periodic table. From the periodic table, we know that the number of protons in an oxygen atom is 8. Since this is neutral, it also has 8 electrons. The mass number is this number. The number of neutrons is going to be 16 minus 8, or 8. Okay, so this is from the periodic table, and the rest I think is pretty straightforward. This is actually a schematic of a mass spectrometer. These are used 
to measure with great accuracy the atomic and molecular masses of different substances. We are going to go into detail about five different um, parts of the mass spectrometer. The first one is the um, vaporization of the sample. That's vaporization of the sample. There's an ionization step. There is an acceleration step. There is a deflection step. And then there is a detection step. Those are the five parts and I guess zones of the spectrometer that you are going to be responsible to know. As in, with a blank piece of paper, draw a schematic of a mass spectrometer and label all the parts and describe their each individual function. This is what one actually looks like. This is another one. This one looks definitely much more complicated than this um, white and gray box. Here's just another picture. And you can see that the deflection here results in different pathways. Okay, with the lightest, oops, with the lightest particle being deflected the most, the heaviest being deflected the least. This magnetic field it uses the um, physical quantity of mass per charge ratio to vary the deflection of those different particles. When you draw a schematic of a mass spectrometer, this is pretty much what you should be drawing here. The five steps, vaporization, ionization, acceleration, deflection, and detection should be labeled. Again, it's used to measure the relative masses of isotopes and the relative abundance of the isotopes in a sample of an element. So we have the vaporized sample becoming ions going through that magnetic field. The amount of deflection depends on the mass charge ratio of the charged particle said that a little earlier. Here are the five stages. First stage, vaporization. The sample has to be has to be in the gaseous form. So if it's a solid or a liquid, a heater is used to vaporize some of the sample. Okay. Second step is ionization. It is the sample is then bombarded with a stream of high energy electrons from an electron gun which knock an electron from an atom. It produces a positive ion. So it's using a stream of electrons to produce a positive ion. It would be represented by this type of equation. The neutral element in the gas form becomes the positive ion in the gas form, and then we have the electron being stripped off. The next step is the acceleration step. An electric field is used to accelerate those positive ions toward the magnetic field. The accelerated ions are focused and pass through a slit. This produces a narrow beam of ions. The next stage is this deflection. They're put through the accelerated ions are then put through a magnetic field. The amount of deflection depends on the mass. I'm sorry, the mass of the deflection is greater when the mass of the positive ion is less, the charge is greater, the velocity is less, and the strength of the magnetic field is greater. So there's four things that are really um, make the deflection greater. So if all of the ions in the mass spectrometer are traveling at the same velocity and carry the same charge, the amount of deflection is going to depend on the mass of the ion. 
and that's really going to be the way that a uh, analysis of a single element works. Okay, so it's going to be separated into different beams depending upon the mass of each of those isotopes. So for any given magnetic field, only ions with a particular mass to charge ratio are going to be deflected sufficiently to reach the detector, meaning they won't hit the walls of the channel. Okay, and then the next final stage is the detections. Ions that re reach the detector electrons cause electrons to be released in an ion current detector. So the amount of current that is produced is proportioned to the number of ions striking the detector. And we get a particular looking graph that converts that current into a peak which is shown in the mass spectrum like this. This would be the results of a mass spectrometer run. It does have many applications, but we're going to focus on what it does with isotopes. If you look here, I have a peak at a relative mass of 24, and the relative abundance is 8. Okay, so about 80% of the magnesium element is the magnesium-24 isotope. Then there's two other peaks, roughly at 10%. That would be the magnesium-25 isotope and the magnesium-26 isotope. We can use these numbers then to calculate the average or the relative atomic mass for magnesium. Oops. Okay, and we can do that just by taking a weighted average. I would take this 0 0.8, that's an 8, times ah, 24 AMU. Add that to 0 0.1 times 25 AMU. Add that to 0.1 times 26 AMU. And I would get an average atomic mass of 24.3 atomic mass unit. This is the average atomic mass for magnesium. You will be asked to calculate average atomic masses given a um, result from a mass spectrometer. Okay, this is what it would look like for boron, zirconium, you can see the difference. So to recap, skills you will need Sketch a mass spectrometer. Identify and describe the five stages. Then make sure that you can calculate Average atomic mass given a mass spectrum.